So we are a minute or two after the hour and we'll get started. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Barbara DiPietro and I am the Senior Policy Director for the National Healthcare for the Homeless Council. Today, we are coming together to talk about vaccines. Uh, this is the hot new topic and there's a lot going on. Um, so really excited to bring folks together and let's just try to level set about where we are. There's a lot of unknowns still, um, but there's a lot we can be doing to prepare. And there's a lot that we can do particularly to increase trust and confidence and information uh, in the vaccines and what's happening. Um, so Brandon, if you could uh, go to the next slide, please. So just want to outline what we'll talk about today and how we'll use the next hour. Uh, we're going to hear from CDC just about the current status of the vaccines and what we know right now. Um, and there's a very just new materials that are coming out of CDC that were designed to help homeless services providers. We're going to hear from our, our great folks from the Boston and the Denver uh, Healthcare for the Homeless programs about how they are approaching their planning and implementation activities, both internal to their HCH programs but also external in their community collaborations and partnerships. We're gonna hear from Katie League about a recent issue brief that we just put out on vaccines that highlights some key factors that are gonna influence the successful campaigns and the action steps that we need to be focused on now. Uh, and then, but really we're gonna have a panel discussion. And this is where all of us uh, come in, an active chat box here, if you can be letting us know your questions that you want to be uh, focused on in this panel discussion. We're gonna focus on both what we need to be doing to make this successful for staff and clients, as well as both, again, internal to our HCH programs, as well as our partnerships with the broader wellness services community and continuums of care. So we wanna to try to address as many of your questions as possible. And then next slide. And then just want to introduce uh, our panelists today. Uh, Dr. Emily Mosides uh, is at the CDC on the homeless unit and has just been a tremendous partner with us throughout all of this COVID response. Uh, Dr. Denise de las Nueces is a medical director at the Boston Healthcare for the Homeless, uh, excuse me, the Boston Healthcare for the Homeless program and an assistant professor of medicine at the Boston University School of Medicine. Uh, Dr. Ed Farrell is the Medical Director of Integrated Health Services at Colorado Coalition for the Homeless in Denver. And then Katie League is with us at the National Healthcare for the Homeless Council as our COVID-19 Project Manager. So these four folks are experts in their field and really excited to have them to talk with us today. Um, next slide. And with that, I don't want to um, hold us up. I want to plunge us right into our discussion. Again, would encourage folks to use the chat to be letting us know what's happening at your organization, but also to be asking questions. So with this, Dr. Mosides, if you could kick, uh, kick start the conversation. Sure, thank you so much. And I am so grateful to be talking with you all today. I'm very grateful to um, get to a chance to hear your questions. Um, especially because this is uh, certainly a light at the end of the tunnel. So earlier this week, the initial doses of COVID-19 vaccine were shipped around the nation and administration, administration began. Yesterday, uh, the FDA Advisory Committee recommended authorization for the Moderna vaccine. And so that means that coming up this weekend, there will be an advisory committee on immunization practices meeting. So that's an advisory co committee through CDC um, to vote on whether or not to recommend the Moderna vaccine. So last week they recommended the Pfizer vaccine. Now they're gonna recommend or vote on whether or not to recommend use of the Moderna vaccine. And importantly, they're also gonna be doing a vote on the next phases of prioritization so that will include considerations for essential workers, people living in congregate settings, older adults, and people with underlying conditions. So very relevant um, to uh, considerations for people experiencing homelessness. Of course, ultimately the phases of vaccination and prioritization will come down to state plans, but these recommendations from the advisory committee on immunization practices will likely inform some of those plans. Um, CDC is thinking about this rollout sort of like a uh, new software for new phones or new software for phones. We're uh, expecting that there will be challenges, but we're hoping to work together really quickly to meet them. 
and uh, you know, particularly when we're thinking about people experiencing homelessness and um, and homeless service providers, we want to be thinking about a couple things in particular, very focusing, very focused on considerations around vaccine confidence and also vaccine coverage and tracking whether or not uh, we've got good coverage among people experiencing homelessness. We, uh, from CDC, we have a new vaccination FAQ that is posted on the CDC's homelessness landing page on the website as of this morning. Um, and we can, I'm sure we'll probably get to some of those questions in this discussion um, and uh, look forward to talking. And with that, I will hand it, I guess, back to Barbara. Great, and I think, um, and Denise, I think you might be next. Uh, next slide. Oh, yes, there we go. Thank you so much, Barbara. Um, and thank you, Emily, as well. Um, good morning or good afternoon, everyone. Really happy to be here to share our planning um, from the Boston Healthcare for the Homeless program. Next slide, please. Um, so briefly, just wanted to touch on some of the state planning that has informed our own internal planning. Um, so our state has published a COVID-19 vaccination plan that's publicly available online. Um, and they have convened an, an, an advisory group as well through the Department of Public Health. Health centers, including ours, are represented through our, our primary care association, the Mass League. And the Mass League itself is has um, uh, convened their own vaccine initiative group that meets weekly. And we are certainly at the table there. We are, our efforts and our planning has certainly been also informed by the um, National Healthcare for the Homeless Council issue brief, which I'm sure, I, which I know we're gonna hear a little bit more about later through Katie. Um, and I just wanted to, to show you all as well, a little bit of the information that the Massachusetts governor shared with us all last week when he unveiled the state's uh, vaccination plan. Next slide, please. And here we go. Um, so just um, a little bit more nuanced details in terms of the state's plan on, um, on available dosing and also prioritization. So for phase one, we fully expect, um, as you all are as well, to be in a limited vaccine environment. The state is anticipating receiving about 300,000 doses of the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines combined through December um, and or from from now through February. And they have really strictly ordered the prioritization of, of, of groups who should be prioritized for vaccine offering. Um, and and as, as has been um, uh, the case on a national level, but just to walk, walk us through for phase one, a clinical and non-clinical healthcare workers doing direct COVID facing care are prioritized as has been happening, followed by long-term care facilities and rest homes, EMS and, and, and other first responders. But importantly, I just wanted to highlight that our state did make the decision to include congregate care settings, including shelters and houses of corrections in this first phase. And in fact, above healthcare workers doing non-COVID facing care. And so that has really greatly informed our own internal prioritization groups, which I'll show you later. Uh, next slide, please. Here's again, some more detailed um, categorization of who is in, in, in each phase and, and in each bucket. Um, if you go on to the next slide, kindly, Brandon, you'll see now what we're doing at Healthcare for the Homeless in Boston to get prepared for accepting this vaccine. First and foremost, we've um, convened internal working groups to put the infrastructure in place needed to safely store and handle the vaccine. Um, we had initially been considering um, getting operationalized in order to receive the Pfizer vaccine, but it looks like, especially given how quickly we will be able to access Moderna vaccine at our site, um, but that's no longer needed, which is wonderful. So we don't have to worry about any of the, of, of the ultra cold storage considerations with that first vaccine, the Pfizer. We have been exploring partnering with other entities like other CHCs and Boston Medical Center, our um, nearest um, uh, hospital with which we're, we're affiliated to share in store doses, in particular when we were exploring the Pfizer vaccine. We've registered through our state's immunization information system, and we're working out how to best and most equitably distribute vaccine while it, while it remains limited. 
and particularly we're drawing from some frameworks on a national and on a state level. If you go on to the next slide, Brandon, kindly, um, you'll see, well, first and foremost, you'll see um, how we have internalized our, our priority groups at BHHP, again, informed by the state's prioritization categories and risk of exposure to COVID. First, our, our first batch of um, vaccines will go to healthcare workers working at our Barbara McGinnis House Medical Respite COVID ward. We do have a 25 bed COVID unit there. Um, and so that is our, our top priority, again, based on risk of exposure to COVID. Secondly, residents and staff of congregate shelters, including adult and family shelters in the city of Boston, and importantly, including shelter staff, as well as our staff who are working at those sites. Thirdly, in prioritization um, will be healthcare workers in, in in non-COVID spacing and non-shelter-based BHHP spaces or Boston Healthcare for the Homeless spaces. And then lastly, all other um, patients who are not staying in congregate settings. Importantly, sub-prioritization within these groups will be needed because we expect to get to be getting vaccines in shipments as small as 100 doses. Um, and so we'll be pulling or looking into, we have been planning rather, looking into um, national and state frameworks about exactly how to do that. If you go on to the next slide, Brandon, you'll see um, that we have been drawing from NASM, the National Academies of Science, um, uh, Engineering and Medicine framework for, for equitable vaccine delivery, um, which categorizes, um, uh, you know, prioritization by phases, very similar to what I showed you earlier from, from the state. But importantly, NASM's framework lists um, equity as a cross-cutting consideration for all of these buckets. And we've really, uh, as an example, they particularly um, use or recommend the use of a social vulnerability index or other tools such as the CDC's um, SVI in order to help make sure that equity is um, first and foremost when considering who first to prioritize to prioritize your vaccine offering. For those of you who may not be familiar with the CDC's SVI, this um, there's a lot of more detail on this on cdc.gov, but um, it's an index that uses US census data to determine the social vulnerability of every census tract. And the CDC in particular, um, uh, emergency response efforts often, and, and, and planners rather, often use the social, the this, this index rather, um, to identify and map communities that will most likely need support before, during, and after um, an emergency event or hazardous events such as COVID. If you go on to the next slide kindly, Brandon, you'll see that, that our state um, of Massachusetts has also published or has also centered equity um, as an important overarching goal in considering, in considering how to offer and deliver the vaccine and distribute it equitably in the state. Um, they have prioritized all COVID facing individuals in the healthcare setting, including food service and environmental services, not just doctors and physicians and, and, and nurses rather. And then there's also this commitment on the state on, on the state level that 20% of additional vaccine will be allocated specifically for communities that have experienced a disproportionately higher burden of COVID and have a high social vulnerability. If you go on to the next slide, Brandon, kindly. You'll see that this is then how we are now approaching um, equitable vaccine delivery up in Boston. We've convened an internal advisory group to help guide our distribution efforts, starting with how we prioritize staff vaccination upon receiving that first allocation of vaccines. Um, the advisory group importantly includes staff from different disciplines throughout the program facilities, environmental services, kitchen, et cetera. We're also meeting with our consumer advisory board to so, so that their input can inform our vaccine prioritization, delivering and messaging campaign. And we've created a staff survey that we launched on Monday with a really tight turnaround of today at 5 p.m. to gather staff input on the vaccine and any concerns, fears or uncertainties that they may have in getting the vaccine. Next slide, please. So we expect to receive our very first, actually, um, our um, McGinnis House respite COVID ward. Ha uh, staff has already been offered the vaccine um, through a partnership with a local hospital. And we, as a community health center, expect to receive our first shipment of 100 doses of the 
Moderna vaccine. We just learned um, by next week, by Wednesday of next week, so really soon. Um, and I believe that's it for my slide deck, but I'm happy to share any more information and answer any questions as they arise. Thank you. Thank you, Denise. And uh, now we'll turn it over to Ed. Take it away. Hey, thanks so much, everybody, uh, for having us all here, specifically myself. Hey, I've got some quick slides only. Uh, Denise, that was a great review of what's going on in Massachusetts. Uh, I'm going to make fun of Colorado uh, a little bit later compared to what's going on in your state, by the way. I do hope that people use that chat box and ask questions because we, we're depending on that today. Um, this is just the interesting thing that COVID has so uh, impregnated and entered our lives that this is now our website. The first update is, hey, coalition updates at the Colorado Coalition for the Homeless. Next slide, please, Brandon. And, you know, I just, we all know how this is going, but this is my favorite resource to see in one fell swoop or one swell swoop, as my friend likes to say, where we are, and it's discouraging. And we're talking about vaccine a lot, and we need to be. And I, I can't emphasize enough to, to our staff, our partners, our shelters. After vaccination, then what? universal precautions continue with masking, physical distancing, hand washing, uh, and everything else. You can drill down to your state at this COVID tracking project. Uh, and if you compare places like Arizona, I, I just feel for them. It's very tough there. And Colorado, somehow, miraculously, we are coming down on hospitalized. This is for the whole USA. Next slide, please, Brandon. And, you know, I just would like to say that th this slide is, is, is my clarion call to myself and our organization, and I think all of us, this is so complicated. This came from the New York Times from this week. And here's this beautiful thing here, just, hey, COVID, join the resistance, get vaccinated. If only it were that easy. And people have been saying, hey, well, maybe we could pay people to get vaccinated. I think the only answer to that question is, I don't know the answer to that question. It's really complicated. We were talking with some of us yesterday who were on the panel today with some additional people and some homeless uh, people experiencing homelessness and shelter said, oh yeah, I, I, I think you should pay me. And I, that would be really cool. But this article goes into the nuance of that. Um, the one thing I'll share here is in terms of, we took a survey just like Denise and Boston HCH surveyed our staff on Monday. Um, we just took the question from the Gallup poll, would you get vaccinated if a vaccine were available right now? And, and I was pretty pleased that 79% said yes, 12% said maybe with lots of comments that indicated that you know with education, we could talk you into it. And then only uh, the 9% said no. And then next slide and last slide for me, Brandon, please. And you know, this is where, uh, and Denise articulated how well Boston is doing in terms of everybody working together as a team with partners. So at CCH, we've had some excellent internal um, le leftover vestiges from when COVID first erupted and we put, we now 700 people in motels uh, in protective action. So that group has, has been a natural form to keep talking about things such as number one, prioritization of staff. We do have a, a rubric for tier 1A1, 1A2, 1A3. Happy to send that out. Uh, Barbara FY changes every day. The one I sent you yesterday is a draft. Um, and it becomes very difficult. We have people who, you know, spend only a little bit of time uh, per week, perhaps in a moderate risk setting. And we're gonna count even that smaller amount of time as going uh, into the higher risk category. In Colorado, we only got 46,000 doses of the Pfizer vaccine. Those are being prioritized by to, to the ICUs, RNs, working in hospitals and other staff. We, we have, um, intimately 
joined arms with Denver Public Health and DDPHE, that's Public Health and Environment, to uh, determine the best way to uh, prioritize staff and get people vaccinated. The very unfortunate thing that happened in Colorado is that initially uh, Colorado was uh, prioritized homeless, uh, people experiencing homelessness as 2A. And then unlike Massachusetts who linked those folks with people incarcerated, the governor and the, their task force made the decision on the second round of thinking, we're gonna make those people uh, priority three, which is, I just think morally, ethically, the totally wrong call. It's also the wrong call uh, you know, from an infectious disease perspective. Now, what we believe in Denver is because we've had these ongoing meetings, and, and this is what I encourage people to do is make sure you're linked tightly with your public health departments, that I think that in Denver, we'll be able to prioritize folks in the congregate shelters with phase release 2A, at least in the metropolitan area, which will be really important. Um, the only other thing I wanted to mention is there is a resource out there, I'll put it in the chat box where you can um, look at your state and the laws that are in your, what, what's happening with your vaccine rollout in your state compared to other places. Um, and, it's, and it goes through all the specifics of the state distribution priorities and people uh, might be interested I sure was because it's gonna help me advocate more with our state health and our public health partners. Let's be more like Massachusetts. I just put that into the uh, box right now. And that's all I have. I'm hoping that we'll get pummeled with lots of questions and comments or Barbara will uh, have things to add as well. Thank you, Ed. Uh, and now we'll go to Katie for a brief update on our issue brief, and then we will uh, start to address the questions that have been rolling in. Good afternoon and good morning to some of you. Um, I saw some joining from even as far as Hawaii, so welcome. Uh, thank you for being a part of this conversation. It's an incredibly exciting um, and somewhat confusing and stressful time, um, but uh, as, as Emily mentioned, this is a light at the end of the tunnel. Um, but it's it's still a long we're we're sprinting through a marathon here so still still a long way to go um, but some exciting things we can do for our community so next slide please um we at the council decided uh, as has been mentioned each state was asked to first submit a draft prioritization plan or a vaccination plan um, in october and then recently the first week in december submitted a uh, a revised um, plan based on how they plan to prioritize vaccinations in their community. Um, as has been mentioned, the CDC has prioritized both uh, healthcare professors, uh, professionals, as well as residents and staff of long-term care facilities. Um, this population or these definitions would include healthcare for the homeless program. However, each state was given the responsibility to come up with their own plan. So as we've seen highlighted in both Boston and out in Colorado, and is the case across the country, every single plan is slightly different, um, both in how they talk about their population, how they prioritize them, and even how organizations and clinics who are traditional vaccine providers will access this particular vaccine, at least initially. Um, so that, that resource that Ed shared is a great one to find out the specifics of your state. Also on the CDC website is a link to each of those original documents that was submitted back in October. Um, so I give a couple examples here that some very broad language, sometimes people experiencing homelessness are referenced specifically. A lot of times our community is reference particularly those who are living in shelters and not so much our broader community. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about how that's a really important thing to engage in the conversation because from the vaccination perspective, they are looking at people who are in congregate settings, which is traditionally a shelter-based setting, um, but our community needs to be prioritized for a wide variety of reasons. 
Next slide, please. Next slide, Brandon. Um, so our, oh, sorry. If you go back one, thank you. Um, I, our issue brief that came out just this week, uh, we have a, quite a few takeaways. We know there's a lot of resources coming at you. So we tried to uh, give some key takeaways for you that are applicable now. Um, as I've been seeing in the chat box, a lot of people are um, are asking about what's going on in their state. And that's exactly uh, where we think you should be prioritizing your time. So in general, there are some key factors that are going to make this vaccine campaign successful. Um, we know that there are great inequities in accessing care for a large variety of reasons. Um, and that there are some in our population of individuals experiencing homelessness, uh, there's a lower immunization rates in general. And there's a large lack of trust due to historic mistreatment, racial inequities in healthcare. Uh, so lots of barriers to accessing or, or openness to vaccination. Um, there's some very big logistical complexities to these two vaccines. Um, we are still learning about them daily. So uh, we will learn from the different states that have started to implement their, their vaccination plan. Um, and anticipate, it's important to anticipate that there will be changes. Um, and that they're just in general, that communication is going to be essential, um, both on the realities of the vaccination, when and how somebody can be vaccinated, and trying to address some of those uh, uncertainties or misinformation that may be out there that are causing somebody to be in, have some hesitation to getting vaccinated. Next slide. Um, so in the issue brief, there are there are 10 action steps. I tried to highlight both of or five of them that I think are essential um, and hopefully address some of your questions. Um, right now, it, it is not too late to get involved in the conversation if your organization is not yet or you're not sure where the conversation is taking place in your state. In some areas, it's still happening at the state level. It hasn't made it out to the local jur jurisdictions yet. Um, but starting getting involved in that conversation and talking about our population from the, the broadest sense of people experiencing homelessness at all housing settings. Um, because while their environment may be prioritized based on if they are living in congregate areas, they should and may be prioritized for different reasons, particularly other health conditions they are living with. Um, this is a, I'm stealing this from Denise, a, a t term that I just absolutely love, um, but developing this concept of vaccine ambassadors uh, among both clients and staff. We need everyone to get vaccinated in order to get to the end of this tunnel. Um, and the hesitation is not only among people who are considered patients of our clinics. It absolutely is happening in our coworkers and um, the same inequities that have taken place and the historic um, mistrust is, is for all levels of individuals. So really having, identifying who in your communities at different levels um, can be used as vaccine ambassadors and encouraging individuals to get that, uh, get their vaccines. Um, utilizing your consumer advisory board and to have these conversations, Ed said greatly, so few people are really in a hard camp of no. And so trying to get everybody to the point of being yes, open to vaccine um, and being very, very open of, of the discussion of the realities of that racism exists in our healthcare system, that there is an overwhelming distrust for a large variety of reasons and that the way to break down that that distrust and, and help get people to the point where they're open to this vaccine is to engage in those conversations. Next slide. And I think that's it. We're, um, so let's pick up our, our panel discussion and thank you for that presentation. All, all of you really appreciate just you bringing your knowledge to this. Um, as I've been keeping my eye on the chat box, I think a lot of folks are trying to figure out 
where they fall in the when are we going to be getting vaccines. And so I'm seeing uh, questions um, about, like, for example, homeless service providers, shelters, unsheltered populations, permanent supportive housing providers. Um, Emily, I, I, I'll kick this to you first. Just again, with those different groups uh, that kind of all fall in these general buckets, uh, what's the best way for people to understand a little bit more about where they fall in the distribution line in their state? Thanks so much for um, that question. Yeah, I think the, the prioritization is, is high on everyone's mind right now. And the, the, some of the big things to be thinking about, you know, how they're doing the prioritizations is based on the epidemiologic risk of contracting COVID. Um, it's based on, uh, you know, a, a workforce that's critical for the continuation, you know, of our society. Um, and it's also based on people who are at highest risk of severe disease. So those are the big categories of people that are going to be um, prioritized. And that's what the advisory committee is basing a lot of their decisions on. But they're really big buckets. So, you know, essential workers, that's a huge group of people. And, and like you mentioned, you know, we, we, could have, um, we could have shelter staff performing a variety of roles. And, you know, some might be at risk of, of infection and some might be at much lower risk of infection. So when it comes down to it, there, these are going to get specified as we um, as we kind of go down the chain. So the states are going to specify further in their state plans. It's very uh, worth looking into your state plan and I can find a link to put into the chat for uh, where all those state plans are. And then uh, and then it's there's going to be sub prioritization, possibly even within that down to a facility level um, sub prioritizations and those considerations. Um, CDC will have some advice on how those decisions are made, uh, but the, that advice is not out yet because the overall recommendations aren't out yet. So there is a, a document of considerations for sub prioritization for healthcare workers and for um, long term care facilities, and I can put that into the chat as well. Um, and that um, that kind of goes through picture like picture layering the prioritization on top of the prioritization. So among essential workers, then you want to start to look at okay, who's frontline? Who's who's really uh, who's going to be facing clients? And then from there, okay, who's who do we have that's in the older adults category? Who do who we have that's um, at risk of severe disease? Um, so so a layering of these prioritizations. Um, and it's it's gonna come down to um, when, <laughs> a lot of these decisions are gonna come down to when the vaccine is actually being rolled out, when these decisions have to be made. So I will put a couple of those links into the chat and hopefully that will um, help answer that question. Thank you. And uh, and for, for the framing that you had put to that response, would you say that also applies for the staff at any of these types of organizations? Or is there different considerations that they should be looking at? Yes, uh, yes, absolutely. So staff, um, uh, staff thinking, through, thinking about staff in that essential worker group, um, if not in the healthcare uh, worker group. Um, and then when we're talking about people in shelters, um, people outside of shelters, thinking about um, that they're that congregate settings is the, a grouping that you want to look at and see where that's prioritized, but also the other characteristics of people experiencing homelessness, like age, underlying conditions, and other, um, and and you know their own employment um, if they have essential worker jobs, things along those lines. Got it. Um, and again, I'm just kind of trying to get some of these umbrella pieces until we. Um, kind of narrow down. So apologies, Emily, this is this is the Dr. Mercedes show right now. Um, when we think about how would people find out, for example, um, should should folks like what will be the alert that lets them know when they're getting it, if they're getting it, where they should go or what to do? Is that something that people should wait to get from someone? And if so, who would that be coming from? 
Yeah, absolutely. So the vaccine right now is going to um, states. And so the states are going to be the ones that will have right now with such a limited number of doses, absolutely, they're going to be the ones that are going to know exactly where it's going. Um, once it gets to be uh, more widely distributed, things might change, but right now it's very much in the hands of the state health departments. So would you recommend that people reach out to the state health department um, or like what action should folks take or should they just wait to be to, to receive information? I think right now we're still in a bit of a waiting pattern for those later um, for those later priority priority groups. So um, if if you're working with um, if you're a healthcare provider or if you're in those initial prioritizations, um, it would make a lot of sense to check in with your employer or with your uh, facility uh, what's going on with the vaccine. Uh, but in the later priority groups, um, I think we're still we're still waiting. As as I mentioned, we're waiting for this weekend to see what those priority groups even look like. So we are going to um, have a lot more information coming very soon. All right. Okay. Thank you for all of that. Um, want to get to an issue that a couple of people have raised about mandating vaccines for staff, and so wanted to talk about. Kind of some of the factors that people were considering about whether or not to mandate again for staff. Um, I guess Ed, did you want to take this first, um, or just trying to? I'll do. I'll take a quick first shot that the, the person who asked that question. Uh, there was a response that did say that when well, it's under EAU under emergency use authorization. I, you know, I, we had this conversation come up amongst Colorado uh, medical directors. I don't think that anybody can really mandate it while it's under EUA. And I'll be honest, I, I can see both sides of this, but you know, Boulder, Colorado is very close to where Denver is. And we call it the Republic of Boulder and it's a haven for the anti-vaxxing movement. And um, I think it's gonna be very difficult to, to say, you know, you must have this vaccine. I think the thing that can happen though, is that people who have been vaccinated twice, and as we, we get more and more people vaccinated, they might not have quite the same degree of PPE requirements. This is, you know, maybe to be announced, to be determined, but that there might be ways to give people some positive things uh, based upon, uh, you know, you've received the vaccine twice. Others thoughts about mandating? You know, I, I, I completely concur with everything that Ed just said. Um, and, and in fact, if it's okay, Barbara, I just wanted to make a point on, on the previous question, oh, sure. which is that, um, you know, for, for, for us as community health centers, for, for those of you who, who have um, staff who may, um, or, or, or individuals who may, who may fall into that first category or that first phasing of prioritization. I think sometimes hearing um, that you need to be in communication with the state could be daunting for those of us who, who aren't in, 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 in um, usual communication with the State Department of Public Health. But we found that our local Department of Public Health has been a great conduit. And so that I, I just wanted to put that out there as well. Um, you know, if you if, if you as a community health center haven't had too much exposure to or, or don't have a um, a strong pre-existing relationship to the state Department of Public Health than the local Department of Public Health, your local one, which should be a great resource. And that's, that's where I would start. Helpful, thank you. Um, Emily, did you, uh, or Katie, did either one of you wanted to add anything to the mandating for staff uh, discussion? Sure, I, I do just wanna add that um, mandates are, are really closely linked to vaccine confidence, right? So a mandate comes into play when there is a problem with confidence. So what we want to work on first and foremost is making sure everybody has the knowledge that they need to have about this vaccine um, as, as clear of information as we can get them and, you know, help to, help to promote trust in the vaccine. And I just to piggyback off of what Emily said, this is the time to be building those confidence campaigns, you know, that communication campaign to 
individuals, as we've discussed right now, is is not going to be the time when we're vaccinating those who have significant reservations, primarily be because there's other people who need and want that vaccine in the priority groups. We are not at the point where we're going to be doing these in-depth outreach campaigns with the vaccines to people who may have some resistance. Now is the time to be doing the education and the relationship building so that when the vaccine becomes available to those individuals, they have moved from a position of no, we're unsure to yes. Um, it's the truth in all of the outreach work that we do, and I'm going to tip my hat and show my experience a little bit here as a clinician, is that we build those relationships so that when any resource becomes available, the relationship is in place so that they are open and trusting of us to provide them with a quality thing, whatever that thing may be. Right now, it's a vaccine. Um, so that's the focus of the work for a, a lot of us. So we are not late in doing this. Now is the time to start those efforts. Excellent, helpful. Um, we had gotten a couple of questions about vaccination and allergic reactions. We've been seeing some in the news. Uh, so both um, discussions about allergic reactions and then also how does the vaccine affect those with autoimmune diseases or um, who are immunosuppressed or may have specific healthcare conditions and are concerned about how the vaccine will impact them. Uh, Denise, did you wanna take uh, the initial response? Yes, I am. I'm, I'm happy to take a stab at it. Um, with regards to how the vaccine affects individuals who may be immunocompromised and who may have weakened immune systems, what we know is that this is not a live vaccine. So unlike other vaccines that have been in use for, for decades, like the Zostavax for shingles or like the, the, the um, MMR for measles, mumps and rubella, um, this, this, the, the technology behind this vaccine um, does not pose a risk to the individual who is immunocompromised. Um, what we do understand about the vaccine also is that although this um, is a vaccine um, technology that for the first time has been licensed. So these are the first vaccines um, using this messenger RNA technology to have been licensed in, in, in the country, um, that this vaccine technology has been studied for the past decade. Um, and so with that, I will say that, um, you know, as a, as a physician, as, as a healthcare worker, um, it's possible that somebody who has a weakened immune system may not mount as robust an immune response to a vaccine. That being said, individuals with, an immune, with a weakened immune system are, would be at increased risk of complications from COVID. And you know, I, I, I would strongly urge people who are um, immunocompromised to consider discussing this with their, with their primary care providers. Um, but it, it absolutely is something for which there is no contraindication and for which Denise, I think we lost your audio. You may have frozen. It would be recommended. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes. Sorry okay. about that. Okay. Oh, okay. goodness. My connection seems to be unstable. Apologies. Um, from the allergy perspective, we have we've been hearing a lot more about that in in, in the media, as you as you stated, Barb. Um, what we know is that individuals, so everybody who who is vaccinated, should be monitored for 15 minutes after that the the first and, and second doses. Um, but people who have a history of of anaphylactic reactions should be monitored longer for 30 minutes after the first and second doses. Um, and what I or what I would recommend is that if if anyone has a significant history of of anaphylaxis or anaphylactic shock, to discuss it with their primary care provider um, to weigh the risks and benefits. But that in and of itself um, is one of the ways that you know the the CDC and and others are recommending that we. Are, are extra cautious for uh, after vaccinating people who may have that history. And Emily, I'm not sure if you have anything to add to that. Well, that was perfect. So thank you so much for, for walking through that. Um, CDC does recommend those observation periods and also recommends 
you know, having a way to manage anaphylaxis at um, vaccination sites. And there is a considerations document for anaphylaxis um, on the CDC website, and I will post it into the chat. We're covering a lot of ground here today, a lot of different kinds of uh, questions. So let's talk about payment and uh, how much it will cost um, at the provider level. And so one of the questions here is, are the batches of vaccinations for people experiencing homelessness and healthcare workers paid for by the state or is it paid for at the provider level? And just get a sense of like, particularly on the ground, like what kinds of expenditures should people expect? Ed, did you want to maybe take this one? This is a hard one. It's probably full of unknowns. Yeah, I'd say it's full of unknowns. And, you know, I, I do know that for our healthcare workers, it, it's coming through the Denver Public Health Department and it will be free of cost. And, you know, and of course, for our patients, it's going to be free, free, free. It has to be free. Um, and then, you know, I'm not as good on the payment side of things as the clinical. So that's all I got. Anyone else want to weigh into um, to that issue? Yes. Um, so, so I can say that um, vaccine doses have already uh, been paid for by by the federal government. So um, there, there may be you know costs for administration, setting up sites, those sorts of things that might not be covered. Uh, but on the whole, cost uh, of the vaccination itself is uh, free to the individual receiving it. And would you say that local jurisdictions, like the local health authority, is the one who would be uh, taking those expenditures for setting up tents or doing those kinds of, of local expenditures? Or would that, again, come to a shelter that would have to, to do that? Or does it depend? Is that also to me? Oh, I, and anyone who might have a perspective on that. And it may be that we don't know. I think we're probably at a point where we don't know, but I would imagine that it would be um, the the expenses would be um, carried by the the entity administering the vaccine, unlikely to be you know a shelter that would be hosting a vaccine event. Great, and thank you, Martha, for putting um, a great Kaiser uh, uh, brief in the chat box that talks about costs as well. So that might be helpful. Um, we had gotten um, some questions, so let's uh, shift to the logistics of the second shot. And so this has been a number of questions we've gotten both in this chat box and in other spaces where with the need to get a shot um, delivered three or four weeks later, particularly for our patient population that tends to be very mobile or accessing uh, services either sporadically or in different places, what are our, um, our thoughts about how do we ensure that second follow-up dose? And how are we tracking this data? Um, does anybody want to start with their thoughts, Denise? Yes, I can start. Um, I would say to, uh, so every, at least in, in Massachusetts, and I, I'm, I'm sure that there's um, counterparts for every state, but when we as a healthcare entity signed our um, state's COVID vaccine um, agreement, Part of that agreement was the expectation on our end that for every dose that we administer, that within 24 hours, we, we document that in, in the state's immunization information system. Um, and I know that our primary care association in Massachusetts, the Mass League, is looking into, is helping us to look into what type of reporting can be done to help facilitate reminders um, for on the healthcare end uh, for that second dose. For us at Healthcare for the Homeless, what we've been considering is, is there anything that we can build into, into HMIS, our, our, our HMIS system as a reminder perhaps that, oh, this person um, within 21 or 28 days, depending on the vaccine that they received, um, please, ask this person to uh, proceed to the shelter clinic, something like that to that, to that effect. We, we have, there's a fair number of people of in, in, in shelters or shelter guests rather who, who are seen by our 
healthcare center and who, who have pre-existing um, charts in our, in our electronic medical record, but there's also a fair number who don't. So for every vaccine that we administered, we will be offering registration into, into the, the electronic medical record that we use. That will help with reporting and with reminders. Um, for those individuals who would rather be vaccinated but not be registered into the electronic medical record, that's where we hope that the state's information or immunization information um, systems or HMIS can help us with the tracking. We also have been considering, geez, what about the individual who was vaccinated with, with with the vaccine during a recent hospitalization, and then it's is an, is 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 discharged. How will we communicate with our hospital partners on that type of communication to decrease vaccine waste? Um, so that's those discussions are also in the works. Um, but that's that's a little bit of how we've been approaching it. Ed or Emily uh, or Katie, did you want to add any? thoughts into that tracking of that second dose or how you, your community is planning on approaching that? I threw mine into the chat box and it's, so it's kind of those big three things as noted. And then we do have our shared, um, it's called Coreo where we can all see the charts of Denver Health and the you and us. And it's, this is gonna be a big lift um, especially because, you know, we should, you know, this will be, I'll turn it over to Emily. Uh, you know, hopefully we'll all, you know, administer a Moderna vaccine with Glee six weeks later after somebody has the Pfizer vaccine, because the only one we have is, is the Moderna. And I think that that's going to have to be a piece of, of what we do. Uh, it's just going to be reality. Emily, anything to add to that? Um, well, yeah, I just want to emphasize the importance of this. Um, one thing that I liked about Denise's answer um, and Ed's actually is that there's multiple angles here. There needs to be some redundancy because um, data collection among people experiencing homelessness is very difficult uh, to accomplish and very necessary for the follow-up and for understanding what coverage looks like. So problem solving this now is gonna be incredibly useful for understanding how things are going um, in, in the future. Okay. And, and we know in the in serving our community, um, in the pre-package we've been hearing that, that sites are getting with their, their dope, before they get their doses, uh, one of the things the CDC has created is a card it's, that we believe can be folded into about uh, just a one half fold will get it down to like business card size. So um, something we know our community tends to hold on to. Um, the CDC's website also does great guidance on there's a kind of a plus or minus four days in the ideal timeline for administering the vaccine. So for Pfizer, it's it's three weeks. After the initial dose for Moderna, it is four. Um, they say the best window is kind of plus or minus four days on either side of those numbers. Um, but they also give guidance that it you don't have to revaccinate. They don't have to initial a, a second first dose if you are outside of those windows. I'm sure we will learn more as as time comes on, but um, that the, a site should not hesitate if somebody comes in at the five or six week mark to administer that second dose. Um, but it is so important to building full immunity uh, to get more than the, the second dose into each person. So uh, really great information on the CDC's website that I, I'm not a, a medical provider and I can tell you it felt very user friendly. So can be really important in thinking of those outreach strategies and what it's going to actually look like in your clinic sites because you're also all working with social distancing restrictions and just the number of people you can have in your clinic sites at any given time. Thank you. And Emily, uh, I'm just going to real quick here. We had a question. So we are not able though to mix and match. So if you get the Moderna first shot, you're getting the Moderna second shot and the same with Pfizer. Um, is that correct? Yes, that is correct. Um, so uh, the, you need to get two uh, vaccines of the same brand. Um, the, and just as Katie mentioned, 
there's a lot more data and information that we're going to be getting soon and learning as things roll out and inherently someone will end up getting getting one of each um but ideally uh more than ideally uh, uh people are supposed to be getting the same brand right we are coming up on the last few minutes we've got time for one more issue to talk about a couple of questions about what happens if an individual refuses um, vaccination. So what happens when our clients, for example, uh, refuse? And then what happens if too many people refuse vaccination? Um, and these are two different um, things. Do, let's start with just at the individual level. Do we have any quick thoughts about what happens, repercussions, or what do we deny them services? Like how, like how does this, this role if someone does not want to get a vaccination? You know, I think that, you know, we've got to put on our trauma informed care hat and universal precautions. Everybody's has trauma. Some people have ACEs scores of 10. And I just don't ever want to say thou must get this vaccine or we will deny you these other things. Great. Others response? I was just gonna say, yeah, I completely agree with Ed. We, um, we had a, a call with our family shelters this morning, and this is a point that we discussed is the importance of, um, you know, proactively messaging to all that um, we're, this is, you know, this, there's, there's so much to, so many barriers to vaccine hesitancy, everything that we described, everything that, that Katie described in particular about mistrust in certain communities that the last thing anyone would want to do is to um, set that precedent of making um, a new vaccine, especially one under under EUA, mandatory um, for such a disenfranchised and vulnerable community. So um, I just want to completely underscore um, and second what Ed just added. Yeah, that's, oh, go ahead. Oh, no, no, I was going to call on you next. <laughs> oh, yeah, great. Um, so, well, I was just going to um, uh, echo that as well and say that, um, uh, you know, we we don't want to see uh, vaccination becoming a barrier to homeless services. Homeless services are crucial, um, and and other healthcare services as well are crucial. So um, so we don't want to see that uh, becoming a barrier. Of course, um, as we know, uh, the the number of people, the percentage of people who get vaccinated, um, will have an impact on the the trajectory of the pandemic, um, but. Every, but everything that Ed and Denise said, I think is um, imperative to keep in mind. Great. And then let's try to squeeze one more clinical question that just came in under the wire about previous positives. Uh, should they be vaccinated or should they be a lower priority? And we might be able to squeeze this right before the end. Um, Emily, is this one for you? It looked like Ed was unmuted. So oh, I was gonna Okay, you. Ed. Yeah, I was only unmuted because I failed to mute, but so Emily, you better make sure I, that I'm quoting things correctly. I, you know, what, one thing is that if people, if, if you have very limited supply and someone's actually had active COVID within the last 90 days, you know, might make sense to, for those people to wait. But at this point, we're recommending no serological testing and no withholding of the vaccine because, um, you know, we just think that the natural immunity that people might get it later and there'd be no reason to, to withhold the vaccine. There, there can be some nuance there, uh, with, like, like I said, with the 90 days, maybe maybe 120 days. Great. Emily? Anything to Completely agree. <laughs> so thanks. Thanks for outlining that. So on that note, um, we are right at time. I absolutely appreciate, thank you so much to all of you for your sharing your expertise today. I really appreciate your presentations, sharing what's going on with you. Everyone is so busy. And so everyone's time here is valuable. Appreciate everybody that came here today. Please keep an eye out. We will be doing more of these conversations as we roll through um, this, as we have been doing. This is still rapidly evolving. So there'll be more coming. And uh, after this uh, webinar comes up, you should get a, uh, an evaluation that will pop up. Please let us know what other topics you would like for the National Healthcare for the Homeless Council to be doing webinars on or what materials we can be developing to help make this vaccine um, extravaganza work well for you. 
Um, so with that, again, a thanks to our panelists. A thanks to all of you for coming today and uh, wishing you a great holiday and a wonderful weekend. Be safe, everyone. Thanks so much.